Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you're all here. I'm glad the Amundsen is full and we have a really amazing evening for you tonight. Um, I'm Anne Field, Chair of Illustration. I also have here um, the fabulous Nick Huffermas. And uh, we're very proud to present uh, Michael Amselak and Matthias Augustinak from MM Paris, who are for the first time here on the West Coast. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> So there's not much more to say um, to stand between those guys who you're coming from and that experience. But it's really, really, we're really, really excited to have some two true visual culture makers here that are incredibly influential right now. Um, and uh, the, the turnout is just a testament to how excited everyone, including us, are that you're here tonight. Um, but this would not be possible without the fabulous support of the French Consulate of Los Angeles. So I'd like to introduce uh, Adelaide Barbier, who is going to tell you a little bit about their involvement and to welcome you also. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, so I'm the French cultural attaché at the uh, Consulate General of France here in Los Angeles. And it means that I'm in charge of cultural exchanges between uh, France and Los Angeles. And what an amazing example of a cultural and higher education exchange here, thanks to what you've done at the Williamson Gallery and the lecture tonight. And um, on behalf of French authorities, I'm very, very happy to say we are super proud that one of the most famous um, school in the United States, and may I say the world, um, is welcoming our fantastic and world famous French um, MM Paris. Um, the very funny thing is um, I was uh, here the very first time of my assignment for several months ago. It was my very, very first um, professional interview uh, meeting Sorry, here, and we were talking about that amazing project. Um, with Anne and um, it was very very funny because I was here in your amazing world famous school talking about those world famous designers and I, I was thinking uh, right after I thought that my job was absolutely amazing that um, it was a very good part of that fantastic program we are creating right now so we were putting together at that time when I met you um, a program that is a five-month program um, cultural exchanges between France and Los Angeles in contemporary art and design. And there's more than 30 um, projects and uh, 70 institutions and 100 artists involved. It's called Ceci n'est pas, in reference uh, to the um, Maghrib painting that you can find at LACMA. And uh, you can have all the information about that um, project that has begun at the beginning of December and will end at the end of April on Cecinepa um, website, which is called cnp-la.org. That's the advertisement part. And so we're um, extremely, extremely proud that we're part of it. So thank you so much to uh, our center. And that said, as Nick said, um, we have finished what we're going to say because the exciting part is here. So welcome, Aaron Smith, Associate Chair of Illustration. Uh, Nancy Regelman, who is faculty in illustration with expertise in fashion. Um, Matthias Augustniak and Michael Anzalag, MM Paris, welcome. On. Are we on? Well, I have a question to begin with. Um, when I walked into your show, I felt like I was entering into a fantasy city, a fantastical city, and with the same kind of layering of imagery that one sees in the kiosks in Paris. And I was also thinking of the traditions of manipulating language and words that are is a very vital tradition in, in Europe. And was interested in what you thought about uh, yourself in terms of those traditions. Um, it's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but it's a kind of a true question. It makes sense. It's um, but how to begin? First of all, um, I think it's important to explain how we came up with this uh, exhibition. Um, to do an exhibition, it's always important to think of the context of where the place, where the exhibition is taking place. And I think uh, we've been in Los Angeles several times, but we've never been in this school. But we had to think of a really loud uh, and spectacular um, way of presenting a work within such a imposant or like a, I would say, bold school. So this is where we came up with this idea of uh, having a background or a backdrop and a very loud backdrop to put our poster on. So that will kind of uh, give a context to all the work that's are pr that are presenting in this gallery. So that was the first uh, intuition we had and this is what we did. But going back to your question, mm, um, we were always interested since we started to work uh, uh, with uh, language, and that was our. This is our specificity to kind of um, <sighs> create a vocabulary that, through time, that will evolve and that will grow, and uh, I don't know. That's create what you see in this gallery. But maybe it's good that you kind of maybe we precise your question because otherwise I might end up, uh, <laughs> you know. Good deal. So um, y y it's, uh, I, I mean, I think the first thing that everyone understands is that you work as a team. Yes. You've been working together for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Correct. <laughs> and um, there's in the book, um, you both actually were interviewed. I think it looks like you were interviewed separately. Yes. Because I think you were kept asking it, or one of you kept asking, did he answer that question? You know, <laughs> Was he asked the same question? <laughs> um, but um, both of you talked about the moment when you met in school and, where it and, um, and you had a distinct outfit. Correct. Um, what was that outfit? Can you describe that outfit? I was dressed in blue from head to toe. Blue shoes, blue socks, blue pants, blue t-shirt, a blue jacket, and a blue over jacket. And you were very proud. I was extremely outfit. proud and bragging, be bragging because it was the first day of school, so I was speaking to my friends, which I hadn't seen since the previous summer, right. about how happy I was to be dressed all in monochrome. Right, because you'd been at the school... <laughs> You'd been in the school longer, and he was a, 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 new, a new arrival. Yeah, Matthias yeah. joined the, the art school that year, yeah. and when I was entering the third year, and he was getting straight in the second year. So you, you were owning it. This is your, this is your place, and then he... I was having my monochrome moment on yes. the first day of school. <laughs> and then, then he very boldly did what? What did he do? I think a couple of hours later, I was like trying to grab a sandwich from the machine in the lobby of the school when somebody bumped me from the back and said, move over monochrome. <laughs> and the rest is history. So did you, and so you had spotted Michael from afar with yeah, his yeah, monochrome. Yeah, because he was wearing blue from head to toe. <laughs> Which I think it wasn't really fair to just to make you like distinguish from the others. So that's why I had to bump into him to say, okay, listen, you know, everyone saw you, you were, but it's because you were uh, like wearing just blue. But then I thought like this guy is very good at uh, manipula manipulating signs right. because he was wearing blue from head to toe, you know. So this is what like uh, bring us together. And then we started like a, you know, like a kind of ongoing series of conversation. And those conversations took place near the sandwich uh, display machine. Display machine. <laughs> Machine, that's yeah. terrible. And well, this this was like a. It was a great machine because there was we had found a way that you open the 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 plexiglass thing, put your hand, <laughs> carve the metal, and then could grab a sandwich for zero. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're wearing blue, everyone's watching us do that. No, that school was empty. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, so you, so on, so, so you guys hit it off right away. Yes. But you're sort of opposites in many ways. Sorry, sorry. You're very op You're very different as individuals, as as in character. Well, like everyone, human beings are different yeah. from each other. No? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, but of I course we are different. Yeah. But, but a lot of the press talks about how different you are. Yeah, because that's what we're cultivating the difference. But yet, but yet there is something in common. And you knew this, r and you and, and right at the beginning of school, and you sort of, did you enter into this um, process, right, kind of collaborative process, right away? Very quickly, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think it was, uh, as I said, it was a series of conversations. I remember once discussing, having a like an intense discussion in the tube about uh, typography, like discussing just like a shape of a letters and uh, also discussing music and having really like uh, tough arguments about like uh, who between stone roses and happy monday would last longer <laughs> and being irritating and uh, michael throwing me a glass of water in yeah the i head. think i remember very precisely <laughs> the day i threw him a glass of water because yes. i w i was pissed off at the fact that he was despising a singer that i was liking a lot <laughs> Do you agree sometimes too much? Do you think like when you have friends and their taste is just like yours, and then, or do you find that there's, do you have different tastes? And you know, oh. Yes, hence yes. the water. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, I, I didn't get the question. Are your tastes oh. different? Are your opinions uh, about food, about music? Do you ever find those clashes help you, or, or do you agree on? Well, this things? is what I'm trying to say. We like. Uh, I think the secret like for two people working together is just like uh, the idea is to push the other to be different and that's 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 as soon as you are like too close or like too you are super super imposed like superposing two people in front of each other and then it doesn't really make sense what uh, we believe in is in we believe in contrast. We believe in contradiction, but yet there is a there, there is a need of a common language. Otherwise, you go nowhere. So that's what we've been working on since we met at school. So conversation is sort of how it started, and it seems like that's really maybe the cornerstone of your of your process. Is, yes, is conversation. Yes, and at the time, then after it has been a kind of um, this idea of conversational process. Then has been kind of uh, I would say people like some people have been writing about it. They have been writing theory about it. But at the time there was no theory about like a, a conversational process. Mm -hmm. This is something we were into, and then there were some other artists or some other like creator like they were obsessed by this same thing. How do you articulate the 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 thought of others and put that in common to create something? bigger or stronger or like uh, to go further than just with that what it is in front of you. When you work with a new client, do you talk with them? Uh, do you meet with them for a long period of time? Does this discussion, this conversation include your clients all the way through the process or do you work with them in the beginning and set out? You were talking about parameters that you set. How do you do that? How does that process work? There's as, man as, much, as many ways as doing it that then then we have uh, clients, which we tend not to call clients anymore. Yeah, and more like people that we engage with and with who we try to to do things together. So uh, yes, we tend to define a set of parameters, but uh, there's many different types of conversations. Some are deeper and take longer when the outcome of the project is gonna need some more uh, thoughts. Some can be quicker, some, some can be instant. And I imagine, I mean, you deal with musicians, and you deal with fine artists, and you deal with, with um, a lot of different um, creative people. And so yeah, it sounds like you're, you deal with them as collaborators rather than clients. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and do you, do you, uh, is there a sense of who will take charge of this? Or do you, is it super fluid? Do you know what I mean? It must be, there must be different kinds of temperament and different kinds of situations where maybe one or the other between you can kind of, kind of uh, take the lead, or is that something you just, you don't ever, 
um, think about? Like how organic is that? You know, neither of us drive, but I think it's like uh, driving a car, like in. And yeah, we don't have a driving license. The, but it's basically, <laughs> the, but it's basically like uh, all these people we met. It's like traveling around like a uh, landscape, mm -hmm. and and it's like basically driving a car. You know, whether we both like neither of us drive, but I think it's the same. Then sometimes we argue on the fact that uh, we sometimes we should turn left or right, or but it's like. There, I think the beauty of it is there is no leading principles. What leads us to um, like to another spot is just like we are interested in someone, and I think we are interested in someone or another situation, but from a different angle. And the interesting thing is uh, that we look at it in a different way and approach it in a different way, and then maybe meet at that place, but through a different uh, path. And that's why, that, that seems to be more the nature of collaboration where somebody has a, a different experience as, the, as their, I the, their imagery and their point of view is filtered through your sensibilities. I mean, the, 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 you're, they're widening their conversation with you. Yes. Yeah. This, this is the most important part in our, in the, in, in our work, it's just uh, how you articulate your thoughts with the thought of someone else. So that takes a long time because uh, you can impose your thought to someone, but that's, you know, that could work. But uh, I think what makes the particularity of a work is that we really spend a lot of time to find the right channel just so there is like a very fluid, uh, like back and forth between the person we are collaborating with like to such an extent that for instance uh, you know with with Bjork that we've been working for like a long long time it's like uh, there is now um, you know who is doing what you know I mean we're not musician but uh, we have been like uh, creating a music language I would say that really belongs to her, but also then belongs to us. So she's obviously really comfortable with the, like extending that conversation and get and I mean w one of the things I'm thinking about is yeah. you, you've had a long standing, uh, you've done maybe 80 um, theater posters yeah. for a specific company. Yeah, and there's an image in on one of them that's 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 take that that was taken from a photo shoot yeah. of Bjork for yeah. her album cover, and then it, then it was sort of. That it, it gets put in your archive and then it, get, it was sort of repurposed yeah. and became a poster for play. Um, and so on some level, she s has to be sort of a, um, a very sort of free person for her to sort of be able to kind of um, extend her, her image out into another context that she has less control over. I mean, you guys, I guess, you, you told me that you asked permission so, uh, when you sort of uh, thought of the, f the image for her to do that. But that's a very specific thing. It seems like uh, there are a lot of musicians that would be very, you know, their agencies or whatever would be freaked out about or the image being kind of repurposed. But I think that seems like, like something maybe they, they, people sign up for when they kind of interact with you. It's, I think it, it this is, this is possible. I mean, this, this is, this, this is like, uh, this kind of things are possible because we've been building a world that's populated not only by our thoughts and our and our production, but it's a kind of a, a world that's shared b with the people we've been collaborating with. So that's that's complicated because now uh, it's like who own this world? That's that 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 could create problems, mm -hmm. but uh, if we're still on the level of an uh, utopia. This is still possible. Of it course. still works. It still yeah. works. And it hasn't become a problem. Like there hasn't been. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes with agencies, there's like you know, 500 pages of documents saying you know the, uh, about copyright. Uh, and no, but I, uh, most of those of those posters for this theater, uh, uh, all of them are using pictures that we took, and and most of them are using pictures featuring people that we cross, uh, that we meet in the streets. We have permission for none of them. 
Yes. <laughs> none of them. None of them knows that they are going to eventually appear on a poster for the theater for the Théâtre de Lorient. Bjork is one of them. Because of our relationship with Bjork, we informed her that we wanted to use that picture for that poster, and she was fine. And, and, and but the only the only legal problem we had with one of those posters was was uh, by a butcher that was featured on one of the posters that saw the poster in a, in an exhibition, and then that sued us to get like uh, as much money as he could because he thought that we were getting rich out of this poster. Yeah. <laughs> wow. One of the objects that you made really thrilled me because it's something that I find, um, I, I find a lot of your work deals with different senses or how we, you, you sometimes make, you made a catalog that was a carpet, I believe. Carpetalog? <laughs> a carpetalog. <laughs> carpetalog. Carpetalog, yeah. So maybe you can describe that, and also your perfume, which I, you have to tell the audience about your. Oh yeah, you your have to tell the audience about many you things. You can come and smell <laughs> it here. I love, I love the idea. No, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, just one last thing about those fiat poster. I mean, the interesting thing about those fiat poster is that they been following us through like sixteen years almost. So they they kind of uh, pre-blog because they very like. Uh, they tell very like uh, common things to very extraordinary things. So they, and it was a way for us just to keep uh, saying what we were working on or working with or meeting or where we were going. And but still telling also the story of the theater that we were working with. So, you know, like we kind of build up this kind of a uh, world that doesn't really exist, but still is populated with all the person or the people we met. And going back to your question, like um, the carpetalog yes. and the perfume. Mm -hmm. um, so why we did the carpetalog? How did that idea, why? No, How did it start? <laughs> no, 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 but uh, it, it was simple. It's just like it started by a very simple commission we were like uh, supposed to launch our book in London, and the editor of the of the book, Emily King, knew a gallerist that specialized in design, and she knew some people in India that were producing carpet. And she said, like, uh, it would be great that you could collaborate in our ga in my gallery, and then you could do some carpets. And uh, for a while, we were a bit. Uh, I don't know, like a bit, uh, um, I would say, we didn't know really why to do carpets. We both, I mean, we have houses, but not big, I mean, not like uh, huge houses. And um, we didn't know really w what was the reason of doing a carpet. But eventually, we came up with the idea that it would be nice to embed our work in some carpets. Because that could be good, <laughs> like if so, some people that bought the book could, at, you know, like could enjoy reading a book on on carpets, you know. <laughs> so we said, like, we should shorten down the selection of our work to like four images, and that was kind of nice because four images, we like, if you really think of it, if you put four carpets next to each other, it almost produce an M, like in a three-dimensional M. So that we started to have an idea. So and then we say like a uh, catalog. If we drop the cat, then there is a carpet carpetalog. So it started to make sense. <laughs> so no, no, but it, it's yeah. true. Just like by shifting words, shifting ideas, suddenly like a bigger idea take, took place, and we say yeah, that's 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 where we can propose like uh, with a kind of a. Like a you know like an an idea that makes sense, like pr like uh, produce a catalog of a work in the dimension of four carpets. Well, and that just as an aside, yeah. you, you also have used typography in other ways, like applied arts, like you made uh, stools or furniture. Yes, and it was a quote from it was it your yes, uh, like from the yeah the drawing teacher like. Uh, he, he was both a drawing teacher and then um, like he was uh, uh, teaching also uh, um, 
uh, graphic design. So you had the, the teacher, not as a drawing teacher, but as a... He was a teaching... He was both our teacher, but he was Matthias' drawing teacher, yeah. and he was my uh, publishing design teacher. And what was the quote? That the quote said? was like, uh, he, he had a really interesting way of seeing drawings, and then he said like, uh, when you draw, to do a very good drawing, you have to imagine that you are like uh, an ant walking on the edge of the visible, which I think really makes sense because that's the whole idea behind drawing. It's just like, how do you describe the world? And how do you turn around something that you're looking at? And I think the best way to to try to understand that idea is just to think like, uh, I'm looking at someone and then suddenly, or some object or some place, and I'm just imagining this ants that slowly but gradually, like it's walking around that uh, thing. I'm sure I, you know, I have to I have to describe by a drawing. So by making this track or like by putting this track down on a piece of paper, I might do a good drawing of the world. So then and you then you took those. So we took this kind of uh, we took this uh, quote and turned this quote into a series of uh, stools by. Uh, how we do? How did we do this? That was very simple. Each letter of the quote, we transform it into a stool. So, for instance, uh, like. Uh, so the letter like bec became a stool, and then I became a stool, and then so on. So we did were then with all those two, we were able to write the quote in a room and then this room became a drawing room because there was like a enough room to sit down people so they could uh, sit down and draw things that we present us to draw because we did a drawing session in that room. I mean, it sounds complicated, but it's simple because you have an image in the book. So you have to buy the book <laughs> for this. Well, and, and you've described this idea of that, that you know, uh, you don't think of yourself as a furniture designer. No. But you think of yourself as somebody who, who makes a, thinks of a chair as an image. Yes. As, uh, am I quoting you right? Yeah, you, you, you read the book right. I think <laughs> that's good. <laughs> and I like that. No, no, but like, no, that, this is the idea of what that, that relates to the first question you said, like about uh, the idea of sign and language. And that was, that's the idea of shaping a space with sign and language. And that's something that's more and more that uh, we are dealing with because uh, especially like when you're shaping the reality is like in our organize a, a space, you have to organize the space so that the space, the space makes sense because we are in this era where everything has to say things. It's a bit like a nightmare where everything has a meaning. So this is where we think we see ourselves when we are designing a store. This is more like a sign that is shaping a space. So that's what I was saying, like the quote did shape a, like a, a, a drawing a drawing room. So that's the idea. I think the stool, the perfume, the carpet. Right, and this is an image from the perfume ad, yeah? yeah? Yeah. All of that are just for us different formats to play with. I think this idea of the format is uh, uh, interesting for us in the way that we've always consider ourselves almost as a band that could uh, explore many different routes and 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 releases things in different formats mm -hmm. just like in the past when the music was pre-digital you could have a single a seven inch a 12 inch an album a double album i think this idea of like trying to change the scale and and having either simpler or more complex or longer or shorter messages was in a way somehow always embedded into the way we were trying to construct what we've done. And uh, and uh, that's why we don't have any kind of limitation into the formats or the mediums we, are, we can we can use to 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 be the vehicles of what we do. The, it, it's you know the it's always mainly based on the idea of language, like and shifting language and shifting the, the meaning of words. As you kind of uh, well uh, like spotted, the idea of like f like uh, shifting from catalog to carpetalog. This is also what we try to 
this is this is the excitement by reshifting the meaning of things and then also mm -hmm. when we created this perfume it was the idea of like reshifting the meaning of perfume because in in our in your field or in the design field or in the art direction field what you, we often are dealing with is like uh, someone gives you a smell and sometimes it's not such a really great smell and then you have to illust illustrate this smell mm. so the idea here was to say okay let's go to see like a professional as a like a professional perfume maker that seems to have like a like a talent to produce this and then that's inspiring with an image, give him an image to think about. And with this image, he should produce like a, a scent that somehow will be closer to what we have in, in mind. And this is how we did. So this is, uh, this is how we created this idea of, uh, this, uh, this is how we worked on like reshifting the meaning of a, of a perfume. Did and you also, um, when you were making the perfume, was it actually the smell of the ix? Um, were you trying to evoke? The was it totally, uh, completely from an image, or I read that it had the smells of the inks that you use? It, 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 I mean, we we gave to the perfume guy three things, mm -hmm. two of them being flat images, and one of them being just like a blood block of solid ink. Ah. Uh, uh, the three images were related to ink. One of them is a picture of like a friend of us, which is an old Japanese uh, calligraphy master who does one calligraphy drawing every day of his life since the last 50 or 60 years. Every day he sits at his desk and creates like one sign. And we have a picture of him doing this one sign. The second image was like a huge, huge, huge drawing that Matthias had made of a, a formula uh, that was kind of secret and and very hardly decipherable, but that was was for us a good metaphor of like what should be the formula for this perfume. And the third thing we gave him was just like this block of solid ink. So all of these elements they they refer to to they use ink and they refer to ink as like just the the basic tool that uh, uh, we can use to create signs. And we wanted the perfume guy to be inspired by all these elements and to try to 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 capture that and translate that into a scent so of course this the smell of the ink is the the was like a um uh just like a starting point but we all, we, we didn't want that just to be like a gimmick of the perfume that smells ink we wanted that for, for him to be inspiring enough for him to create like a, a proper fragrance that we would be able to wear so it's interesting yeah i mean it sounds like that that sort of reverse um direction uh, from the norm of the mm. graphic designer always serving the client and, and mm. sort of um, uh, bringing clarity to a, an idea. So it, 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 you guys have sort of uh, come to the point where often you're doing, you're introducing ideas into the world. And yeah, we are, bring, we are bringing opacity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's like, a, I mean, I don't want to sound like a, big or like pretentious but it's a bit like in philosophy where the main the main thing is to to ask the right question or to formulate the right question and often people have a like often people that we've been working with they they have the passion of doing something they excited by you know they they have something in mind and they come up with a preconceived question but that's often not the right question that that they're asking so the first thing that we do is we help them to reformulate the question, just to know exactly what they want to ask us. So this is why we kind of uh, are, uh, you know, like it's like, that's why we are like, uh, uh, how do you, the, the, the it's like the way you said, like uh, we are re-bending the yeah, we are rebending the person just in front of us, so they are then uh, acts towards what what we are doing, and so something from that uh, encounter could come out and make more sense. So this is, I think, it very important, just as a more down to earth uh, relationship to graphic design. You know, because otherwise we go too much into kind of a like a stratospheric part. Mm -hmm. But just like to be very plain, 
I think most of the time what's very important is to, when you're a graphic designer, is to think, does the person in front of me ask, you know, is this person asking me the right question? And that's, you know, it's, there is nothing wrong of, like, to say to someone, like, uh, you know, uh, to say to this person, is it like a, do you understand completely what you're saying, or I don't understand what you are saying, and then to have him make or having this person formulate a really a clear question, basically, because otherwise you, it's impossible to produce a good piece of design. I think this is the key point of like uh, the design, uh, like producing design pieces, just to have a right question that has, that is asked in front of you, otherwise. But what I really like about in in the context yeah. of what you were saying, that you're, you help them to write the, to come up with the correct question, but it's not a closed-ended question because your solutions often are, they have, a, uh, they're not as a direct answer. Some of the elements that you put in are poetic or they're, they're layered meaning that, so it's not as direct. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we may, we, you know, like uh, when we've helped someone to formulate the right question, we often answer with another question, which is much nicer because then it's an open, it's an open, I would say, path to something else. Right. Do, do, you, do you feel like you're responding in, uh, that there's a generational thing happening that I think so, that, that, um, we were having a conversation that, that a lot of your faculty, you know, if you brought an album, uh, you know, to show or something, some popular cultural thing to, to class, then it would be, you'd be asked to put it away. And that, that, that commerce was sort of off the table in, in your, during your education. Um, and, and yet, I think you, you, you both seem to have a very different relationship with commerce. Like, uh, can you talk about that, about your reaction to that, to, um, to your, your um, education. <laughs> I stumped you. Yeah, uh, well, it's true. But we were born in a in a east in a, we were born in an historical moment where there was still like a, a conflict between capitalism and communism. Now uh, the co capitalism is everywhere. I mean, apart from China, but still, it's like a, so. It's true that there was a kind of like when we were going to school. There was still this kind of, uh, there was still this big uh, political conflict between people that were believing in a more, that were believing in capitalism and the other, they were believing in communism, not like a uh, hardcore communism, but like uh, the relationship to commerce was not like grounded like it is right now. Uh, we were in a school that belonged to the state, so when we were showing signs of a uh, culture that were embedded within uh, commerce or commerce. related to uh, private money, uh, some teachers were suspicious. We were not suspicious because we, can, we knew that, uh, not because we were like seeing in the future, but we felt that uh, the world would change and uh, we would end up by working in a capitalist world. So, but I think because of this, we always uh, fight to keep culture vivid, even in a very hardcore uh, commercial context. So I think maybe the, the aim of our work was to say, well, how do we make culture uh, still vivid and strong within the commercial sub context that sometimes are shifting things in a place where it's not so... Well, well there's, there seems to be this battle, I, maybe in your work, between high and low yeah. culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a, you know, George Kondo, yeah. uh, that's a Kanye West yeah. uh, uh, scarf. Yes. Yeah, so, and, and so you're working with, with two probably fairly significant egos, if I yes. might imagine. <laughs> no, no, but that's, that it's a, this, is, this is a very good example of the work we've been dealing with. And I think that's kind of very synthetic of uh, how, the, how the world is now. 
it's like uh, you are right we are dealing here with two extremely big egos and we are dealing also with like a, a musician that has understands that uh, sign of uh, richness are now longer like big cars of of or like uh, big girls, it's more like now a sign of richness is art or culture. And I think that was extremely in uh, interesting how Kanye West bought like six different paintings from George Kondo to say, okay, they're gonna be the image of my album that was called... Uh, uh my Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. And um, that was kind of a very clever act. And then... Uh, he came to see us and then uh, just to say, well, how am I going to do a record cover with those paintings? So, of course, he had ideas. And um, the, ideas, the ideas he had didn't really work. I mean, they kind of work somehow, but not extreme, like not as we imagined they should have worked. He wasn't asking the right questions. Well, exactly. So we it, it took time to reformulate the, the good question, and eventually we came with a, this good answer that's still having no, a it, question. He came, he came to us asking for us to design a logo to go over the painting. And we told him, for the painting, you don't need a logo, you need a frame. So what we did is write his name and the title of the album as a frame around those paintings. And the, and then that's we, uh, we wanted this to be the record cover, but it didn't. It wasn't. It's not exactly what it is. Like this, the record cover for this album is not exactly this. But eventually, we came up with this answer just to say, okay, let's release five different scarves, where you will have this big frame that says the name of the of the record and the name of the singer, and this become I think the right answer for the record cover of this album. So of course it is not like a physical record cover like a uh, sticky fingers was like uh, but this is like a, a contemporary record cover it symbolizes or it synthesizes this uh, this uh, musical project and that brings to mind this whole this whole mashup of fine art and fashion yeah. and graphic design and interior design I mean all these kinds of uh, things sort of um, that 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 can be seen as very distinct, but you obviously don't see them as uh, the boundaries as being distinct. Well, I think I, we see them as very distinct. For me, it's just every, all those kind of uh, activities, they became a language. Now it's clear and it's kind of uh, taking for granted that all this is producing signs. That wasn't that clear at the beginning of the 20th century, but it's all what happened, now we are in the 20th century, we know, every, you know, we know, twenty first century, but we know by, we know by a fact that uh, every, you know, like a dress, is has a meaning. A photograph has a meaning. Of course, it's more than this, but it does say something. So all those things, when you articulate them together, they have a meaning. So this is why there is, a, as you say, a mashup. It's not that everything is the same, but you can articulate all those things as like uh, parts of a sentence so it makes a bigger it has a bigger meaning and so at the end so you can articulate the fashion designer with an interior designer with an artist or an all of these all of these are still cultural activities i think that's the common thread we are working within the realm of culture so it's true that as graphic designer and as top of our, our like uh, our activity is that uh, we are specialized in signs and we are specialized in differ in deciphering them so this is why we are able to navigate through those worlds but we don't see ourselves as fashion designers we can talk with them we can exchange ideas and this is where i think it's going back to the beginning of like the conversation we had like to push everyone in their specificities do you tell stories when I was reading about fashion identity. Yeah. Fashion identity. Do you help people to tell stories about themselves, or stories? Y you're talking about language. And mm -hmm. Fashion is is permeates our lives everywhere. And when you are making these images, you're recreating them. What how we see things visually. Uh, do you help people to? How do you think about fashion as uh, a storytelling device? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a good question you're asking, and it's a good point you're making. It's because uh, it's true that for a long time, uh, fashion didn't have any history. I mean, it has history. There is an history of fashion, but uh, fashion was tending to erase its, its, its history. Like every six months, they would do something new. That was the idea of uh, of fashion. Like each six months, they would erase what they did before. And it's like uh, maybe I would say around the nineties where they started to the you know like there were some designers that were obsessed with the idea of like constructing an archive you know like uh, not just doing new things every six months but just building building an history because they understood the value of an history of a cultural history especially when also when the big names of fashion died they started to die. Mm -hmm. So they understood the value of uh, the history of a house. So it's true that uh, like our approach to fashion was to work with designer and make them understand the value of, uh, uh, of the history they were building and the, the value of like uh, that what was built like six months before could be included in what they would do in six months and on and on. And th and that's interesting because that's that's an unusual part I think from an, an outsider point of view in the way you work because you construct an archive yourself and reuse your imagery. Yeah. I mean, like all of the type that you design is is you don't license it, it's yours, mm -hmm. and yep. then you'll reuse it in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so um, so archive the archive is part of your studio practice, um, and you yes. and you create independent photographs yourself that you yeah. just you build a you have a uh, body of images that you work with yes to do that's that. true true yeah. correct yeah. right i know i'm just yeah. no no but it's true no but like i think you pointed it right i think it's uh you you know you making good good observation about the way we work i think this is this is the idea of like rolling a ball and this ball will be a magnetic ball and then and it will attract things that we are like uh, it will attract things that we where we are passing by, and then also uh, people we are discussing with. So it's at the end it's a bigger and bigger ball. So that has like uh, the track of the past, and that kind of forcing what we would do next somehow. This yeah. is this is a uh, this is like it goes. Also, I mean, it's against the idea of modernism where. It's uh, you know he, he was put together in world by uh, uh, Nicolas Borio and he called it alter modern, so that was not postmodern and it was not modern. It was just the idea of like uh, having this modernist approach where you believe in the kind of a uh, progress or like you say, well, I'm building a world, I'm building building an utopia, but instead of erasing the past or instead of uh, make flattening down everything, it's just you taking in account that uh, there is hazard, that there is maybe mistake, and then maybe there is not like one direct line, but you might have to go in a labyrinthic way just to to go somewhere. And then also taking in account that, uh, you know, like uh, that uh, the taste of, a, of an A in America is, is different of a taste uh, of an A in Spain or in Germany, or that's kind of so. That is also the way we work, kind of a refocusing each time. Uh, in like uh, each context has its uh, like specific uh, approach. And so, uh, so almost the same image it just has different resonance in different contexts. Yes, and and exactly. And that's its meaning. That's that's the idea. Like. Uh, I mean, this is the uh, this this whole idea of like uh, how what's something neutral. I mean, there are many people that uh, talk about the idea of neutral, but this is the idea of like uh, um, for us, uh, neutral is the idea of how like uh, how a good neutral thing is. Uh, it's like an object that absorbs its context and that's able to re like spit it in another place to rebuild in another context and, and, and so on. What's so great about that is you're not really anchored into one year. So your work could have a, could keep building into the future 
Yes. I think, and it doesn't seem to, what I really like is it doesn't feel like it's all digital or all American or all French. It yeah. has this quality about re that it's its own definition. So you could keep refining and defining it, but it doesn't fit into one co one context? Does, does that make sense to you? That yes, yeah. it, I, it makes sense to me. Uh, I hope it makes sense for the people in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, uh, you know, but like uh, if it makes sense for you, I hope it, you know, that's the idea. It's like try to help the audience to understand this. It's just like, you know, it's, it's really like peeling an orange, you know? It's like it takes time to get in the core of things, but... It's, it's more like an onion. Well, no? like an yeah. onion. I, I, I messed up. I missed up the two. I, I, I kind of uh, tears. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah you, you said that you would dive in if, if if ever he went off his his point. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so like it's it's true. It's spilling an, uh, an onion, not an orange. Yeah. Sorry, I, uh, I, okay. mix, I mix it up. But I, 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 I mean the book again, like that you should really buy. It's like <laughs> no, but like no, it's extremely well designed by those uh, uh, English designers. And that's uh, really what? <laughs> oh, okay, 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 okay. No, like, but the, it, it, what was what's interesting in the book, and that really uh, makes this idea that we've been trying to discuss until now clearer, is that uh, this I, this book is built like a, I would say, like an atlas. You know, like uh, it describes a world. Rather than just being a compilation of of a work, it describes a yeah, it describes a space that you could navigate through, and the navigation instead of being it's instead of being a navigation by continents, it's a navigation by uh, the habitants. So that's why, like at the top of the page, mostly there are the names of people we've been working with. So. You know, I don't want to sound poetic, but like each person is a country. Oh, you, you know, do. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we we're actually running out of time, but um, yeah. I, unfortunately, is there any? Uh, uh, really quickly, um, we see a lot of work, and, and when you guys look at the book and you go to the gallery, you'll see that you're very prolific, and and you work very fast. You have a reputation for working very fast, and it seems like there would be teams of people in your studio and actually there's it's actually a much smaller studio than I think people realize it's really you plus how many people but you haven't been there so how I, do you I just <laughs> <laughs> no 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 <laughs> it was, I was joking <laughs> no it's true the, the studio is us plus four we are six you people plus four. Yeah. yeah 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 and it's very and it's a relatively peaceful place it's very peaceful yeah except when we fight when you fight <laughs> who wins who wins Nobody wins. No. When we fight, we both lose. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and, there are n and there are no windows in your um, no studio? No, no windows. So you can't throw each other out the window? No. no. no, no through no the wind. roof. No, through, through the roof. <laughs> there, are sky there are skylights. Yeah. yeah. Skylights. Good yeah. deal. Um, so I think we, uh, we're going to... Are we going to raffle some of these? <laughs> raffle, 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 <laughs> raffle. Yeah. What? Ten, ten bucks. Ten. Yeah. Yeah. Let, are you guys? Pick would you like numbers. to answer some questions from the audience? Yes. Of yeah. Course. Questions. Okay. Questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, how many? Okay. So we're gonna. There, everybody, what? calm down. It's crazy time. Silence. Silence. Okay. We're gonna do. We are gonna pull ten oh, numbers. <laughs> Is everyone hold up your ticket? Are you a ho holding a ticket? Look at you. It's like a concert. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because we are a band. So we're going to read off. We will read off 10. <laughs> Those of you that win, you may squeal with delight, but don't come down to the front. <laughs> um, it, hold on to your ticket, and then you can claim them um, after we're done. Two, two, eight, up in eight, the Amundsen, uh, nine, I mean, up in oh. The Williamson. This is my ticket. I won my own book. You did not. <laughs> No, did you read it? I, no, no, I took it. No, no, I read my, the oh, ticket okay. I had in my yeah, pocket. No, so okay. Do you want to read them? Or do you want... Yeah. What? Are you, are you, how they, they how many books? Your English is very good. So, you can so read how, many, how many books? I have ten ten books in I can ten. do ten. Ten. So Oh, ten. Take five and Pick read ten. Oh, two, two, 
eight eight seven. Okay, which are the numbers that are this, that are different? Okay, nine more. That is, that's, that was the word. <laughs> well, if no one shall, we take another one. No okay. squealing. There's no squealing. Two two nine zero oh, six nine. Two two nine zero oh, six nine. There you go. Wow. Right, we'll keep that. Let's put That's kind of magical. <laughs> two two nine zero oh, nine one. There he is. Yes. Yeah. Remain in your seat. Remain in your seat, sir. Yes. Stay in your seat. Shh. Okay, two two eight. But how do we know the two two eight nine two nine? No squealing. No. Seven to go. Seven to go. Shh. Yeah. So we lose this one. No, I, I think they're That's just shy. Me. Are you That's shy? That's mine. That's mine. Give it to me. We can't have shy winners. <laughs> okay, shy lose. Okay. Two, two, eight, eight, six, three. That's also mine. Two, two, nine, one, three, five. There you go. Yes. yes. They're not good with numbers. They're creative people. They're not good with numbers. <laughs> two, two, nine, oh, five, six. Wow. So you, must, you must yell and be excited, okay? Yeah. Okay, you must be extremely yes, yes, excited. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> two, two, nine. One, three, eight. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one more. Last and one. Two, two, nine, oh, seven, oh. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. So the winners, the wow. winners, hold on to your tickets. It's like a comedy college here. <laughs> and you can retrieve them up in front of the gallery when we're done. Okay, we're going to take, let's take um, a few questions. Not too many. Just a, a couple two of questions. Two questions. Two. Um, who has a, you are a very intelligent person. What are person. the best two let's questions? Do you want to stand, can you stand and ask a question? Hello. Um, when I look at your work, I feel like there's kind of a sense of, like, I feel a little bit uneasy mm -hmm. because. Um, ben, sorry say your that. name. Oh, I'm Introduce ben. yourself. My, sorry. My name is Ben Sanders. I'm part of the illustration department. Uh, when, I, when I look at your work, because it's so varied and because from piece to piece, it seems like you're pulling from all different areas of kind of the border of where you guys are exploring. I was just wondering, like, um, how does uneasiness play into your process? And when you let something leave the studio, how uneasy are you about it? Does that make sense? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> like, but absolutely not. Like, are are you always so? It's, are you always a, sure, or are you thinking that you're you're always sure? Yes, of course. If you're not okay. sure, it's like uh, what's you know. No, but but do you? Mm, wanna, I'm gonna do something. <laughs> but do you want also want to create a sense of unease in the viewer? Do you do you want how much tension do you want to have in your work, at, when people see it? A lot of tension. <laughs> is that is that does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, now a better question. Are you are you easy, are you do you feel more easy or more <laughs> relaxed? Can you feel the tension? <laughs> are you you're very anxious? Well, I can't really solve your problem then. That's not. <laughs> I mean, there is many things we can do, but that part I can't. <laughs> Anxiety, all this, I can't really deal with. I can. Yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> okay, next. There we go. Oh, God, am I running? Okay. And earlier, you made the distinction, you were talking about working with different mediums, working with different people, mm -hmm. and you mentioned working with interior designers, musicians, and mm -hmm. artists, and I was mm -hmm. wondering, why you made that distinction and what artist means to you. <laughs> I feel like that's yours. <laughs> um, K. 
Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I was, I was mesmerized by your, your glass full of yes. water. <laughs> That's why. You referenced working with interior designers, musicians, yes. and artists. Yes. And you I just, was wondering I think, why I you think, made that distinction. Yes. I think we were just giving an example of the type of people that we are working with. It was not like the set of... It was not like three definite categories of the people we're exclusively working with, if that's your question. Uh, we're working with many different kinds of people, doing many different kinds of things in all kinds of fields, including people doing interior design, or people doing perfume, or people doing fashion, or people doing art, or people doing champagne, or people doing whatever. So, so it's just like it was a way to express that uh, We've been working with people from all across a very wide spectrum from the creative field. And you don't see a hierarchy necessarily in those no. realms? No. Okay. Was it answering your question? <laughs> okay. That's good. All right. uh, uh, hi. Bonjour. Hi. Bonjour. Um, can you explain to, uh, to these kids how when you started um, your career, you dealt, because right now you're the masters of design and, you know, life is great. But the, in the early 90s, when you dealt with uh, record companies and stuff like that, mm -hmm. how did you uh, were able to push your ideas that was all, a little bit uh, really uh, forward thinking and you had clients that were not they didn't understand what you guys were doing. So how did you do that at the beginning of your career? <laughs> this is like Jedi stuff. Mm. It's what? <laughs> Pardon? But it's, it's a very French question. <laughs> no, but this is. Uh, uh, look at this. No, but, like, the, the, but it's a very French question. <laughs> it's like. Uh, it seems like. Uh, How did we become Jedi masters, basically? That's your question. Yes. <laughs> Because that, I think that's what they, they no, want to I know think, here. I think we were, I think it's not like a... It's about a thing in the blood, you know, it's like you, you, you learn about that in the first episode of Star Wars. I see. <laughs> this is awesome. Thank you. Please, no more questions. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.